This is the 10 Minute Teacher Podcast with your host, Vicki Davis. Today's sponsor is Lumio, an award winning digital learning tool that will transform your lessons into active, collaborative learning experiences. To learn about Lumio and how to sign up for free, head to lum.io today. And stay tuned at the end of the show to learn more. Hey, everybody, thank you for listening to the 10 Minute Teacher. This is Vicki Davis. Today's episode, I want to share thoughts from my summer reading. I set a goal way back in 2008 when I had read that Brian Tracy said that you could move to the top of your field by reading an hour a day. This has made a big difference in my career. First, if you read on the Kindle like I do, go to read.amazon.com forward slash notebook and take a look at the notes and the quotes that you have read. A big part of reading for me is not not only reading, but listening again to it on Audible or reinforcing it in taking those note cards. One of the first books I've read this summer is Love is the Killer App by Tim Sanders. Now, this is a little bit older and the apps are outdated. However, the concept is not. So first, he makes the argument that being truly knowledgeable and helpful is a way to show love. Now, this is not the same as being a know-it-all. We all know those people who just want to talk to hear themselves talk. This is talking about truly listening to others in finding the knowledge that will help them. Now, he says knowledge makes him more valuable than ever because by building up his intangibles, he's creating much more worth than his position requires. For me, as instructional technology, I love to listen to teachers and their problems and take notes. And then can I find an app or two that will help them with that problem? For example, right now, teachers are spending too much time grading. Can I find apps and ways to help them improve that? Second, I really think that in some ways this book is like the modern day Dale Carnegie, How to Influence and Influence People, because he advocates that all of us should try to be bright and generous with our address books in a way so that we increase knowledge, expand our network, and share our compassion. Now, this doesn't mean go give the addresses and phone numbers of everybody in your book, but there are ways to connect. I know for me, people who are really busy, I have a lot of those folks in my address book, so I'm really careful, but sometimes I do ask for introduction. My friend Richard Byrne the other day who writes Free Tech for Teachers shot me an email and said, hey, Vicki, can I introduce you to this organization? And it was like, yeah, and I really appreciated it. Now, Tim Sanders in his book, Love is the Killer App, makes the argument that 80% of what we read should be books because books are a complete thought meal containing hypotheses, data, research, and conclusions combined in a thorough attempt to transfer knowledge. And if they're good, they contain that essential value proposition, that meta idea or that statement a fact that gives the reader a unique perspective. And he says the other 20% of reading should be articles in newspapers. I really am moving back towards books because I'm finding that a lot of people are just writing on what's trending in the moment. I don't think that's really how we should be living our lives. We need to seek and figure out, okay, what's important? This whole trending hashtag feeding frenzy is really creating it where we care more about what others are saying than we do about what needs to be said. I set as a goal that I want to get back to reading an hour a night and I read a book a week. And I am really trying to go back to 80% books, but then I'm also reading in Feedly and reading blog posts for those who are writing meaningful blogs. The challenge is people just don't read blogs like they used to because social media does not like external links. If you link to something outside their site, they don't want you to go outside their site. So you cannot trust Twitter or Instagram or any of those to show you what you need to be reading. You have to have an RSS reader. You need to have a podcatcher, which catches all those podcasts. And you need to decide intentionally what is going to be your media diet. One other interesting thing Tim Sanders says that he always reads hardback and he writes the notes in the front and back. However, I'm really using a method I learned in a book called How to Take Smart Notes, One Simple Technique to Boost Writing, Learning, and Thinking for Students, Academics, and non fiction book writers by Zunka Ahrens. This book is a translation, but Dr. Ahrens studied one of the most prolific writers in nonfiction history and found out what he did. And 
know, he had a slip box and he put index cards. John Maxwell, who is the well-known motivational writer here in the United States, also uses a very similar method. So I have adapted Zunka's method of taking notes. So while I write the things in the front and the back of the book, or I put it in my Kindle, I'm going back and I'm putting those on note cards and filing it in a certain way that helps me see patterns as I start writing. I also went on a quest to find out the books that my colleagues are reading and I'm making a list. And this reminds me of an old episode of Every Classroom Matters I did with Todd Nesloni, where he had every teacher in principal have a sign that says, this is what I'm reading now. And they had a cover of the book to share that. The last thing I want to mention about Love is a Killer app, if somebody asks how you're doing, so many of us just say, I'm fine. And half the time we don't mean it. But he says, I'm okay if you're okay. And I like that because it leads back to the other person. It could be cheesy, but you'll have to figure out a way to pull that in. So a book I'm reading right now is Code Breaker. Jennifer Doudna, Gene Editing and the Future of the Human Race. She studied RNA and also was part of the team that found CRISPR, which is the gene editing tool. Now, this is such an important topic, but she as a person is fascinating. It actually said in the introduction that she had mastered the art of being tightly scheduled while still finding time to connect with people emotionally. I think there's something there that more of us need to learn about. But the book states something that's very true. Figuring out if and when to edit our genes will be one of the most consequential questions of the 21st century. It also states that students who study digital coding will be joined by those who study genetic coding. This is going to be a very important topic. I need to understand CRISPR and the impacts of gene editing. And this is going to be a huge issue that we need to discuss. And it's already causing a lot of controversy. Our students, if we don't include ethics in our conversations, will be totally unprepared to have the ethical and the moral pieces of the conversation that need to happen when we talk about gene editing. Truly an important topic here. The other thing that Jennifer Dodna, the scientist, talked about her favorite teacher and said that the teacher taught that science was about a process of figuring things out. And she also mentioned that the key to true curiosity is pausing to ponder the causes. What makes the sky blue or the sunset pink or a leaf of sleeping grass curl? So I ask you, do our students of today have a moment to look at sleeping grass curl? Do they have a minute to look at the sunset or even to lay on the ground and look at the sky? This sense of wonder and time to ponder is definitely something that needs to happen more. This same concept is mentioned in another book that I've picked up called TechWise Family by Andy Crouch. Andy Crouch in this book says we're continually being nudged by our devices towards a set of choices. The question is whether those choices are are leading us to the life we actually want. And one key part of the art of living faithfully with technology is setting up better nudges for ourselves. But nudges, however, will never be enough. Nudges play to our weakness, our tendency to take the easy road most taken. They change the environment outside us in order to make good choices easier, but nudges will never on their own build the wisdom and courage we need, partly because we often can't control our environment how much we'd like to. I'm really fascinated by this because some of the most gifted students I've ever taught, their families did not have TVs until they were in double digits and they do not have cell phones. If I see a child who does not have a cell phone and they are in eighth or ninth grade, pretty much without exception, that child is in the top 10% of the class. There can be a few exceptions, but in my experience, those kids are just different and I think that there's something there. So for me, as I struggle and look at the things I want to accomplish. I've got a book I've been working on for some time and I've asked myself if I totally got rid of social media, would that book be done? Getting off social media is definitely advocated by Cal Newport with his Deep Work philosophy. Another great book if you haven't read it. Deep Work is more of what I need to do. This is why I've been testing the Motion app for time management, which is truly transformational and uses AI to help schedule my tasks. I'm just getting so much more done. What Motion is really doing for me is helping me understand that my time is finite and how much I have overbooked myself. However, this tech-wise philosophy is really making me think about what I'm doing as an adult and how much I want to watch TV. I don't like 
what the algorithms are doing to me. For example, I broke my foot. So now I think I know every single person who has broken their foot that's in my friend group in social media, and it gets intimidating. I have friends who have cancer, and now they know of everyone in their friend group who has cancer. Now, it's not a bad thing to know and empathize and encourage people, but for example, I am always willing to pray for people, but now every single prayer request of my 3,000 friends on Facebook is showing up for me, and so it feels overwhelming and inundating, and sometimes it's people I don't know very well, which you could say, Vicki, you've got too many, quote, friends, but all of us know that everybody in our connections in Facebook is not truly our friend. The algorithms are really creating an environment I don't care for. I wish I had more control over the algorithms and what it showed me because I don't think it's nudging me towards excellence and positive accomplishment. I think it's nudging me more down and depressed and upset and I find myself having to just get off of social media. There's another quote that he has in the book from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It says, let him who cannot be alone beware of community. Let him who is not in community beware of being alone. My problem is that we think getting on social media is being part of a community. It is not. Social media is the only activity we do completely alone that makes us think that we're with a bunch of people. We are the app and the algorithm shows us what it wants us to see. I just don't like the person the algorithms are programming me to be. And so now the question is, what am I going to do about it? I feel like those algorithms are making me less creative, less connective, and less everything. So I'm really working hard to have more lunches and breakfasts with people. I've also read out. Austin Cleon's new book, Keep Going, 10 Ways to Stay Creative in Good Times and Bad. Austin says you don't need to be on a plane to practice airplane mode, that you can transform any mundane moment to a stretch of captive time into an opportunity to reconnect with yourself and your work. Airplane mode is not just a setting on your phone. It can be a way of life. Amen to that. He also quotes Anne Lamott, who says almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. So like Cal Newport in Deep Work, it's about focusing on the things we want to accomplish. One of my best reads of the summer, I can't even share with you. My husband and I were visiting with our dear former pastor, Michael, and his wife, Terry, Kat. He had gone in a very old pastor's house, Vance Havner. So if you don't know who he is, this is what Billy Graham said at his funeral, that someone has said that everyone was born an original and dies a copy. But that wasn't true of Vance Havner. Vance Havner was born an original and he died original. And he truly wrote some remarkable things. But I'll tell you, the greatest things I've ever read that he has written are in his journal entries that Michael found in his house. So I can't share share them, but I'm really hoping that Michael will find a publisher for it. But I will say this, if you've got a book in you, write it. We need more people who will write with legitimacy and authenticity like I read in that journal. As our internet is being taken over with AI, I've even seen this thing called Jasper that supposedly will write blog posts for me. You know what? Jasper can't live my life and I want to live my life. You're seeing a lot of stuff coming on the internet now with all these AI Google optimized writers and we're really really losing something about the human condition. It is becoming okay with me if I write stuff that Google hates. If I have 20 of you out there who will follow my blog with RSS Reader or get it delivered by email or follow the podcast and will listen, then that's just going to be okay with me. I may not be popular, but if I can serve those who find me helpful, then that's going to be great. Last thing I want to mention is from The Last Lion Alone, 1934 to 1940, Part 1 by William Manchester about Winston Churchill. Now, I've been listening to this on Audible for a very long time, multiple years. There was a statement that talked about the students at Oxford just prior to World War II. And Manchester says the students were uncompromising pacifists. Now, I want you to think about that. An uncompromising pacifist will compromise with anyone in order to have peace, like Neville Chamberlain did with Adolf Hitler. So he was an uncompromising pacifist, which meant he would compromise with the devil himself. We need to think about what we're uncompromising about. I'm very concerned that we are uncompromising about the wrong things. For example, when some people say kids need to just figure out what's right for themselves. Okay. Many of them are being somewhat raised by video games, by social media. It is not right to go and shoot up a school. We're very upset by that in Texas 
and it was done by a high school dropout. And I'm thinking to myself, something was missed there, whether it was keeping him in school and keeping him engaged. If we can stop someone from even wanting to harm another person, then we don't have to worry about stationing extra police or people carrying guns or anything because we've stopped that. I'm just really thinking about what should I be uncompromising on? For me, we've got a right to disagree agreeably or disagreeably, if you like. The freedom of speech is important. I don't think shaming or bullying is ever okay, even if you find someone's views reprehensible. This is why Twitter is so difficult right now. Such animosity because Twitter's algorithms are favoring those things that cause controversy. And some things shouldn't be debatable in terms of it's never okay to go take the life of another. I'm just really thinking about the uncompromising pacifists at Oxford before World War II and that's what the students there really felt and what are we uncompromising about and what does it mean for the future of our world so those are some of the books I'm thinking about for this summer and I hope that you have some thoughts I encourage you to shoot me an email vicky at coolcatteacher.com that's v-i-c-k-i at coolcatteacher.com or message me on social media. I'm at coolcatteacher everywhere. And let me see what you think about these thoughts or what are you reading? Let me know. Let me hear from you. A big thank you to our sponsor, Lumio, for this episode. If you're looking for a collaborative learning tool to make it easy to level up your lesson materials you already have with assessments, game-based activities, collaborative spaces, and lots more all in one place, Lumio is the perfect choice for you. Head to lum.io for more information and to sign up for free. I'm using this in my classroom, so join me and try Lumio. That's lum.io. You've been listening to the 10-Minute Teacher Podcast. If you like this program, you can find more at coolcatteacher.com. If you wish to see more content by Vicki Davis, you can find her on Facebook and Twitter under Cool Cat Teacher. Thank you for listening.